So I'm going to start talking about the idea of clustering and classification, two key concepts that we think about when we do machine learning or even when we think about AI architectures, which are basically uh, trying to extract dominant features that represent the data. And with those dominant features, the goal then is to start to understand how we might be able to do downstream tasks, potentially of control, potentially of of just diagnostics and characterization. And most of, it is, most of this is coming through this clustering and classification idea, which is really going after dominant features that help us distinguish what makes one data one part of one cluster versus another. So we're gonna start getting after some of this, and I wanna start showing some of the examples here that will get us towards that goal. So this is kind of out of chapter five of databookuw.com. You can find more information there as well as an extensive set of lectures both around this topic and applications of this topic. So let's talk about this, clustering classification. The idea is gonna be I wanna take data and I wanna see if it's part of a cluster and I want to label those clusters to make, and that's going to be the idea of the classification, is providing a label to that data that is somehow interpretable and meaningful for diagnostics and decision making. So part of what I want to go after here is start giving you some intuition around the kind of data that we might want to look at and the kind of structure it has and what it means to cluster, what it means to classify in these scenarios. So I'm gonna give you first this example. Very intuitive, easy to understand, and has a lot of the features we wanna think about, which is, I'm gonna give you, this is a data set that's built into MATLAB, which is some iris data set, which is three type of irises. And these irises, you measure for each iris, the petal length, the petal width, which is not shown, because it'd be four dimensional, sepal width, sepal length. So there's four measures that come off of this iris. So you measure these, and what we know is there's different iris varieties, and for instance here we measure Setosa, Versicolor, and Virginica, and each one is denoted by either magenta, green, or blue balls, and there they are. This is what they look like in this space. So this is already getting to this idea of classification and clustering. The classification is I provided you what the classification was, which is three different varieties of viruses. The clustering is evident by inspection. So you have here the magenta with the Stotosta irises. They're all grouped down here, which have having similar, similar sepal length, sepal width, and petal length. And you can also look at the petal width. And so the nice thing is that, look at this, they're all clustered together nicely here. Over here, the Versicolor and Virginica are a little bit more, are, are a little closer to each other. However, you clearly see that there's green down here, blue up here. So the idea is, I can start looking at these clusters and you see these three, what look like three distinct clusters. The clusters don't have to be mutually exclusive in the sense that there is overlap right here, for instance. However, there is a dominant structure that's clearly visible around where the greens, where the blues, and where the magenta are. So I haven't done any data analysis. All I simply did was took these four measures of these irises, and I just plotted them in different color balls. But right away, it gives you the ideas that we're gonna go after, which is classification, clustering, they're all evident here in this picture. So, uh, so that's what's kind of nice about this data set. It's very intuitive. You can understand the major ideas that we're gonna go after uh, in, in a very simple demonstration, okay? Now, what's not as simple, but it's still intuitively obvious to us, are what this feature space we need to be looking at, in fact, Essentially, I've given you a nice feature space to do the clustering, but now I want to turn our attention to something else, which is I want to do a task of trying to recognize dogs versus cats. So for instance here, what I've given you is a set of data, and I've got 20 dog pictures. And in fact, I have a total of 80, so I'm just giving you a representation of the 20 that are in there, and there they are. 
So I've cropped the images so that the face and eyes are about the same size. In fact, we've looked at this data set previously, and we're going to look at the, some of the low rank features out of this so that we can do clustering and classification. Okay, so these are the raw images of dogs, and correspondingly, I have images of cats. So there's 20 cat pictures. They're not even very high quality. It's just some set of 80 dogs and cats we want to play around with. Now the real question comes, uh, how do we start building out an algorithm that would cluster and classify a new dog? So if I give you a new picture, I want to write an algorithm that would say, is this a dog or a cat? And I'd like it to be fairly accurate. So part of the question you have to ask yourself is, what are you doing to recognize those as cats? And what are you doing to recognize those as dogs? In some sense, your brain has been trained to be a very accurate classifier between dogs and cats. Okay? But what we want to do is try to figure out, like, how would I train a computer to recognize the difference and to recognize it at the accuracy that we have? Now, in the world that we're giving you here, there's only 80 dogs and cats. So in the next lecture, I'm going to talk about the space of all dogs and cats versus the data that I give you, which is a small subsection or small subselection of the entire world. Okay, 80 dogs and cats is not a whole lot compared to the incredible variety of dogs and cats you might actually see in real life. So we want to start thinking about what are the features? How do we do this in an automated way? So let's do some coding. I'm going to go to a set of code here where we're going to walk through and start figuring out how to get down to this feature space. So bring it here. Here is my code. So what I have talked about is that we've got some cat and dog data. Here it is, load dog data, load cat data and then concatenate them together into this matrix CD, which is the dog and cat data put together. Now what I'm going to do with this is I want to explore the feature space. So one way to do that is through the singular value decomposition, which gives us the dominant correlative structures in this data. That is in chapter earlier chapters of the book. So we're going to basically take this and say, take this data, subtract the mean, do an SVD. So the SVD is going to say, take this data matrix and look at the eigenvectors of the correlation matrix. Okay? The SVD is a powerful tool for extracting dominant features in a data set. So what we've just done there is to do that. And what we can do then here is to pull out the first four modes. Okay, so our goal here is to take out here, if you look at the U vector, I'm going to pull out the first four columns as we go through this loop four times. I'm going to reshape this because right now the dogs and cats are in vectorized form. So it's 64 by 64 pixels that have made into one vector of length 496. So now I'm going to go ahead and pull them out, reshape them, and then plot them. Okay, so for you to look at. Not only am I going to do that, but then I'm going to also say, well, let's go ahead and also plot what the V matrix is going to tell me here. It's going to tell me how, how each dog and each cat projects onto the, the modes U. So if, if I pull up the first four modes, what I'd really like to know is for every single one of those 80 dogs and cats, how do they project onto those dominant spatial features. So let me just show you what these look like and then we can discuss the results. So if I run this section, here we go. Let me pull these together here. So first I want to start here. These are the first four dominant features of those raw images. So this is mode one, mode two, mode three, and mode four. So what you're seeing here, this is the dominant correlated structure. So this has the most correlation. This is an orthogonal direction with the second most correlation, orthogonal to both 
third most correlation, and so forth. So this is what the SVT tells us. Notice that there are some features that are being extracted. So first of all, if you look in this first one here, you clearly see this is where the eyes are in those pictures. This is where the nose mouth area is. And notice up here, you get the signature of these little ear structures. Now the second one, again, you can see the eyes, a little bit of nose, Again, ear structure. The third one clearly sort of has some top half of this thing going with some eyes and so forth. So there's, there's some actually interpretable features that come out from this correlation, right? And so part of the question is, how does every dog and cat project onto these pictures? So what we can look at is that projection, which is given here. All right, so here's what I want to show with this. So this is mode one. This is the first dominant feature. And notice this is 160 pictures. The first 80 are dogs, second 80 are cats. Now what you notice here is, in the, at least in the first mode, everyone's projecting in some kind of what looks like, you know, you can't tell really if there's any difference between dogs and cats in that at all. The first 80 don't look any much different than the second 80. However, mode 2, I would like to highlight, in mode 2, look at mode 2, the projection of the dogs in almost all positives, and you have a dominant negative projection for the cats. So mode 2 seems to have some kind of ability to distinguish between what a dog and a cat is. You still see mode 3 as well, look at this, a lot of dogs have a lot of correlation high up here in this mode, less so in the cats, and so, and here's the projection onto the fourth mode. So the question is, what I can do with something like this is to start to say, look, I know the first 80 are dogs, the second 80 are cats, so why don't I plot a histogram of the distribution of these values for the dogs and for the cats? So I can see, do I see a difference statistically between dogs and cats in these first four features, which were those SVD modes I showed you previously. And here is the result of that. Here are the distributions between the dogs and cats, the red and the blue. So in the first mode, you can see there's almost the two, the two histograms sit on top of each other, so the probability distributions are virtually indistinguishable. But as I pointed out, look at the second mode. The second mode, you clearly see a separation of the distribution of values. So this is the place where you can start making some decisions about classification. That second mode gives you valuable information for separating dogs and cats from each other. Okay. Again, the third and fourth mode, not so clear. But I think that uh, the last picture I want to show you then is to say, well, I could take all this and I could start scattering them on the first three modes and here's what you would look like. The green and the blue are the dogs and cats and you can see that essentially you can see some clusters of greens over here, magentas over here, but they're really intermixed. And this is problematic. And in the one direction that they're separated, that was the second mode. Okay? So you're not going to get a very <coughs> good classification between these two using these kind of features of the data. Instead, what we want to do is we're going to switch data sets. We're going to do the same experiment. But now, what we're going to do instead is load the data in which in fact are the dogs and cats in the wavelet transform domain. So wavelet dogs, wavelet cats. So there they are. This is what this data set gives us. And so uh, we're going to do the same experiment. We're going to take this. We're going to look at the first four modes. We're going to draw a histogram of its distribution on the V values, which tells us how each dog and cat is projecting onto those modes. And then we're going to see what kind of features can we extract out of that. So in running this section, let me show you here. We'll pull this over. 
This, oops, this is the picture I want to show you. There's actually two pictures here. So first of all, I want to just show you four pictures of dogs and cats in this wavelet representation. So what wavelets do is they help, they basically focus on the edges. So if I took those original data of the dogs and the cats, for instance, I'm just showing you four dogs, this is look, what they look like in the wavelet representation. Notice that the wavelet representation actually really highlights the edges very nicely. And so now we're going to build a model based upon seeing the edges. Now what the advantage of this is, it starts to not care so much about the, the, the fur pattern or the fur color because it's now just focused in on the edges, which are ears, eyes, noses, things of this nature. Okay, so that's what those data look like in the wavelet domain. And when you do the singular value decomposition to get the correlation structure, here's what it looks like. These are the first four modes. Much richer in terms of structure Notice the eyes and the nose here. Also notice the prominent ear signatures that are here for both mode one and two, especially. Now what's going to be interesting about this is that when we look at how these project onto dogs and cats, what a dog is, let me just, this is just a sort of back of the envelope type calculation. I'm going to show you this in a minute here. But what a dog is, is if, notice that the, the Ear features are so prominent. So what a dog is, is if I took this first mode and I subtracted the second mode. In other words, what it's really going to do is subtract off those ears because the dogs have droopy ears and they don't typically have the triangular ears. So if mode one minus mode two subtracts off ears, a cat is mode one plus mode two, which emphasizes the ears. So this is the feature space where we can actually do very nice classification and clustering tasks, which I'll show you in a minute here. Okay? All right. So let's look at some of these. So first of all, I want to show you the distribution of values for all the dogs and cats on mode one through mode four. So here's all the dogs and cats projected onto mode one. Notice that they're primarily positive projections, positive numbers. There's of course exceptions. Here's some, some here, but for the most part, positive. Now mode two, notice that the dogs have a negative value dominantly. Cats have a positive value. So again, if I I'm constructing these. Remember that the SVD modes provide me a basis to construct all the pictures. Then mode one plus mode two emphasizes the ear. This is mode one minus mode two, which subtracts the ears. You can also see in mode three, again, a lot of positives here, variability in the cats. Uh, and also here, negative now in mode four, more, mostly positive in mode four for the cat. So these are the kind of structures we're looking at. And what I want to highlight then is to think about the distribution. Oop, did I put it here? Let me get it right there. All right, here is a histogram of the distribution of values of the projections of mode one through mode four for this dog and cat data. So the blue and the red are the dog and cat data. So the first mode, the two probability distributions sit right on top of each other. So in other words, when I produce this histogram of this distribution, it's sort of like your PDF of the data. They sit on top of each other. They're virtually indistinguishable. <coughs> but mode two, check this out. Mode two has a very nice separation between the dogs and the cats. It's information you can start to use to make a classification. In other words, I can take a new dog and cat, project it onto these modes, and somehow, this mode here is, if I end up in this distribution of blue versus red, I can make a distinction whether it's a cat or dog. Mode three, not much separation, but mode four, again, something to go after. In other words, that feature can be exploited because the PDFs look like they're separated.
And then if I look at these distribution of balls uh, of the dogs and cats, then here's what you have. Here is now a projection of this onto this principal component space where the green and the magenta now are much more clearly separated than they were in the previous example when I used the raw images. In fact, when you do this kind of analysis here, you can make a very nice classification algorithm which gets you in the 80% of recognizing dogs versus cat. So you're significantly above coin flip, which would be just guess 50% chance of being right. You're in the 80% chance by going after these dominant features in the data which allow you to determine which cluster you're actually in. So a new dog and cat, you bring in the picture, project it on these SVD modes, project it into this space and say, are you a green ball or magenta ball? And just by doing something like that, you can get a, you know, uh, a, it's a very uh, simple algorithm and you can get fairly, fairly good accuracy with that. So that's kind of uh, all I wanted to talk about with this. Here we go. Let's go back to our slides here. Okay, so that gives you the code, and it's trying to tell you something important about what it means to do classification and clustering. And I just want to highlight again the results here of the dog-cat problem, because that was something where we lived in a pixel space of 4,096 values. And that really wasn't the space we wanted to do clustering and classification in. What we, really did, what we did is we projected into some low rank feature space, which we got from doing in a singular value decomposition, which gives us the dominant correlated structures. And we projected all our dogs and cats into that. We did it both on the raw images which gave us this kind of clustering here. This is in principal component space one, two, three. We also did this in the wavelet domain, which gave us this here. So the important thing about this is to notice that what clustering and classification are trying to do is to see what you really would love to see in data is that similar type of data. In other words, dogs or cats their data cluster together nicely so that you can make easily make a classification decision. Okay, and that's what we're going to start working on a lot in this chapter is how do we go about in principled ways taking a set of labeled data or unlabeled data and starting to make decisions about what cluster the data belongs to and how do I classify that data. And so part of what we need to talk about is supervised and unsupervised learning algorithms and actually talk about some of the dominant algorithms people use in both supervised and unsupervised learning uh, so that we can get ourselves further along in using these data analysis tools on real data sets. So, finish there. All the lectures, all the, all the code that I used here is at databookuw.com along with a PDF version of the book, so you can download that. Lots more lectures to watch, so go check it out, and you can learn lots of different things about clustering and classification in Chapter 5 of the book.